In section 5.4, we finally get to the conclusion of this chapter where we get to the actual application of everything we've been doing so far in chapter 5. And this again is linear programming, which is part of a larger topic known as optimization, where we're trying to find the best result given some sort of limitations, some sort of restrictions, and we find the best possible output. So as we talked about, there's uh, the case of the uh, Berlin airlift where this first came into uh, common knowledge when people used this to find a way to move supplies in a way that uh, took into account the limited airplanes, pilots, and so on that they had to work with. But again, these concepts are now used all over the world in all sorts of industries to take limited resources and find the best result. So in short, the idea is it's a method to find the maximum or minimum. The best result in some cases is the maximum, the highest value. But if, for instance, you're looking at something like cost, you want to minimize that. So the best case is to find the minimum. And then the idea is that there's some limitations or constraints that we have to take into account. So in our examples, we're going to deal with problems where there are two variables, and we'll talk about what those look like, and then several constraints on those variables and some sort of thing that we're trying to maximize or minimize. So there's a, a few terms that we have to get used to in this section. There's some new terminology, but basically the section goes through three examples. The first example is written out in a lot of detail to kind of give you a sense of how this works, and then the other two are a little bit quicker because once you get used to the terminology and the process, they all start to look very similar. So this first example will look relatively long, and, and these problems can look long when you first get started, but once you get the hang of it, once you see how they work, you'll find that one problem looks very much like the next. So here's an example, and you can read through this, but the idea is that there's someone who takes on multiple jobs, walking a dog, babysitting, and the goal is to maximize her earnings. So this is the case where we want to pay attention to what we're trying to maximize. Earnings is our, our objective function. That's the term we'll use for that. The objective function, think about our objective, our goal is to maximize that. So that's our objective function. And then there's some information about that objective function, how much she earns doing each job. Then there's some limitations. Notice these limitations that she can only work up to 20 hours per week, and there's some other constraints that are given. So that's another term that we'll use. The objective is the thing that we're trying to maximize or minimize. The constraints are what limitations we have. Because if there were no limitations, notice that she makes more babysitting, and so she would just work non-stop babysitting, and that would maximize her earnings. Where this gets interesting is the fact that she has some limitations, some constraints. So that's why we have to do a little more work. So that's the basic setup is that you're given information about objective and about constraints. Those are the two pieces you want to keep in mind as you're going through one of these problems. But I'll show you how to step through the problem in a systematic way to keep track of what you're doing and not get lost in all the details. So the first step is to identify variables. And variables are things that we get to control. These are things that basically it's our job to pick values for. So if you read through the problem, it's clear that what you're trying to pick is how many hours to spend dog walking and how many hours to spend babysitting. So those two pieces are what you get to decide, what you get to control, and so that's the variables. Those are the things that could change. So that's the first thing you have to identify. And you'll label one of them X and one of them Y. And it really doesn't matter which one you call X and which one you call Y, as long as once you set that, you are careful to stick to your naming pattern. So those are your variables. X and Y represent these two things. So in, given, in a given problem, just look for what things you get to control, what you get to decide on, and that's a good hint as to what the variables are. The next step is to set up the objective function. So we want to identify what it represents. In this case, it's the amount of money that she's making doing these two uh, jobs. And then we want to be able to write that down in terms of x and y. We want a way to 
uh, a function that describes for a particular value of x and y what the revenue would be, what her earnings would be. A simple way to do this, and one that often works, is to think about splitting this objective function into two pieces. In other words, how much of this objective comes from dog walking, x, and how much comes from babysitting, y. And it's often easier to think of it in those terms. The first time you do this, it will seem um, harder and more confusing, but the next time you do it, and the time after that, and as you see multiple examples, you'll see they tend to kind of fit the same pattern. So once you've done one, the next one will probably go a lot easier. So if you think about how much money she makes dog walking, if she makes $8 an hour doing that, and she spends X hours doing it, the total money she gets from that is 8 times X. And the same thing for babysitting, 9.75 times Y. And if you add those together, you get her total income. That's the objective function. So there's your objective function. Generally, it's going to be this combination of something from X and something from Y, something from dog walking and babysitting in this case. Then you want to look at the constraints and think about what limitations are mentioned. There are three limitations in the problem, and they're listed here. And the idea now is to figure out how to write these as inequalities in terms of X and Y. So if she can work no more than 20 hours a week total, whatever X and Y end up being, if you add them together, the total cannot be greater than 20. So it must be less than or equal to 20. So we can write an inequality like X plus Y less than or equal to 20. And then you can follow the pattern for the other two as well to see how to write those constraints as inequalities. There are a couple of extra inequalities that are often not mentioned, but the fact that x has to be greater than or equal to 0 and y has to be greater than or equal to 0 is often true because just by the practical concepts in the problem, there's no way to work less than 0 hours at any given job. So we have these three constraints plus the two sort of natural ones that x and y both have to be bigger than 0. And the next step is to take these constraints, these inequalities, and graph the solution to that system of inequalities, which we talked about in section 5.3. And this is called the feasible region. Basically, the feasible region is all the values of x and y that fit all the constraints at once. In other words, they're combinations of hours spent dog walking and hours spent babysitting that are possible given all of these constraints. Values of x and y that she's allowed to pick. In other words, she couldn't pick x is 3. She couldn't spend only 3 hours a week dog walking because there's this limitation that x has to be greater than or equal to 5. So the solution to this system of inequalities, this feasible region, is all of the values of x and y that um, satisfy all the constraints at once. So that's step four to graph this. And this doesn't spend a lot of time on the details here because you can go back to section 5.3 to remind yourself how to do it. But you've got this uh, line in blue represents one constraint, the line in red represents another, and the line in green represents a third. And the solution to all of them happens to be this shaded region down here. So it's under the red line, it's to the right of the green line, and it's also under the blue line. So there's that feasible region. Now we get to the conclusion of linear programming, which says that if we can draw this feasible region, it turns out that the optimal point, the best case scenario, is going to be one of the corners of this feasible region. So notice there are four corners. There are these two on the left on the green line. There's the one where the blue and red cross, and there's the one where the blue crosses the x-axis. So those four corners are the four possibilities, and one of those four is going to be the best case scenario. One of those four is going to be the worst case scenario. So by limiting our choices to just four, the last step is going to be to figure out which one gives us the best case and worst case scenarios. So this is what we call this fundamental theorem of linear programming. In short, it just says that the, the corners are what we're looking for. So the next step is to figure out what those corners are. 
and some of them you can read off the graph. So for instance, by graphing this blue line, if you use the intercepts to graph it, you get one of the corner points for free, which is nice. Graphing this green line, you can probably tell what this point is automatically. But the other two really come down to solving systems of equations. Now where the green and red cross, you might be able to tell what the answer is without doing any algebra, but where the blue and red cross probably are not it's not very clear exactly what point that is. So this is where we need to solve a system of linear equations to figure out where two lines cross. So we take the blue line and the red line, we set up a system of equations to solve that. And that's what's going on here to find that intersection point. Again, it doesn't show a lot of detail here, but you can go back to section 5.2 to review solving systems of equations if you need help with that. And then the other three, you kind of get freely from the graph. There's not a lot of work you have to do but now we found these four corner points of the feasible region. The last step, again, is to figure out which one's the best and the worst. So all we do is we take those four possibilities and we figure out for each possibility how much would she end up making. If she spent X hours dog walking and Y hours babysitting, what would her income be? And so we test that for each combination at the four corner points, 13.7, 57, 50, and 20, 0. And we find that the best case scenario, the highest revenue, is when she spends 13 hours dog walking and 7 hours babysitting. The worst case scenario, of course, would be 5 hours dog walking and no hours babysitting. But we want the best case. So, in short, to solve a linear programming problem, the basic idea is to find the feasible region and find the corners and then test them. Now the details of finding the feasible region and finding the corners comes down to a lot of the algebra that we did earlier in this chapter and before you can do any of that you have to set up the problem well where you pick your variables, find your objective function, and find your constraints. So there's a lot of setup but once you have the objective function and the constraints correctly set up the rest of it is doing the algebra to graph the feasible region and find the corner points. Of course you can also use some technology to find these corner points if you use something like Desmos to graph these inequalities you can find the corners very quickly and easily there so you don't necessarily have to spend a lot of time finding these by hand doing the substitution and elimination but if you need to you can of course do all that algebra as needed in a given problem. So here's a quick summary of what the step-by-step -step process looks like. Again, if you like seeing these steps written out, you can read this here. And then the rest of the section goes through two more problems. So there's another problem here that follows the exact same steps. And I won't go through this one in, in as much detail, but very quickly it just goes through the same steps of finding variables, figuring out what your objective function is, and what constraints or limitations there are, and then graphing this feasible region, which looks a little more complicated, but it's the same idea and again finding the corner points because those are the candidates, the possibilities for where the best case and worst case scenario will be. And so you test those corner points to figure out what the best or optimal case is. Then there's a quick description of why the fundamental theorem works this way. This is optional. You can read through this if you're interested, if you're wondering you know, why is it that the corners are the significant part? Why is it that the edges are the significant part? You can read through this. I'm not going to spend time going over it here, uh, but you can kind of follow along if you're interested. It's purely just in case you're interested in seeing that. And then there's one last example. Going back to the question of the Berlin airlift, this is a very, very simple version of it uh, that again goes through the exact same steps as the first two problems, just to give you a little more practice, a little more sense of what these look like. But once you've seen a couple of them, you're ready to go off and do ones on your own just like this. Just remember, your goal is to find the feasible region and find the corners of it so that you can test those to find where your best case scenario will be.